Um, just want to start off by saying thanks to Valerie uh, for organizing such a, a well thought out and intentional event this evening. You've got a great uh, AGO chapter um, functioning and, and lots of great things happening amongst uh, organists there. And I just want to say um, that I'm really excited and happy to join you this evening. Um, I'm, as, as you've read, I'm calling in from Kansas City area. So actually in the heart of Kansas City right now at Country Club Christian Church. And I'm relocated to this area in January, actually started on January 1st and then March came and the rest is history. So um, it's, uh, it's been an exciting and very challenging time for, for myself and my family um, in, in this move and trying to take on a, um, a, a new role. Um, I, I started as the director of music and am now directing music and media and IT and wearing many hats here at Country Club. Um, mainly in response um, to COVID um, and to the pandemic, things have changed somewhat <laughs> dramatically as they, they have for everyone. Um, I was hired uh, as the full-time organist here at Country Club Christian Church, but previous to this um, uh, position, I was working as a software engineer in Utah, um, programming Java for a credit union software. So quite a quite a departure and it was my intent to make a full uh, dive back into music and get off the computer um, and it didn't work so well <laughs> with uh, March coming along um, here I am right uh, thrown back into tech and uh, which is which is something I also like I must say that I much more uh, enjoy I enjoy much more uh, tech as as a church musician and, and from the worship and church scene than I do from the from the banking software aspect. So it's uh it's it's still a um a welcome treat for me to be able to engage in the ministries that that I'm working in now. So that's a little bit about myself. Um just just some things that we should assume, I guess, maybe at the beginning. Um and that is uh as I'm going through some information tonight we need to assume that we all have very different needs. Um, we're all in different places in terms of uh, whether we're organists or techs or in our various congregations and churches, we, we just have a wide variety of, of needs. Um, and I don't have all your answers and that's because each of you are in a unique situation, position where um, you, can, you can find all the answers so to speak on Google, and yet you've got to figure out what really works for you and what works for your budgets and what works for, you know, day in and day out, week after week. Um, and I, I can't answer those questions for you. Uh, I'm just going to try to equip us with as many resources and, and kind of educate us broadly if I can do the best I can with that. Also, I'm excited to, to constantly learn right along with everyone else. And I hadn't um, I hadn't heard a lot about Da Vinci, but I Ilana, I, I'm, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, she, she mentioned that she was using Da Vinci as her video editing software. Um, and so I quickly Googled it and um, without, without knowing much about it, it's made by Black Magic. So um, it's gotta be a good product. So anyways, I'm always learning. It's fun to engage um, in this. Last thing that we should assume is that technology costs a lot of time and a lot of money. So um, the things that I'm going to mention this evening, just, just keep that in mind that um, this is a big commitment on everyone's part. And I know that all of us are trying to embrace change and trying to enhance and to, to make things better. But sometimes we have a lot of constraints, uh, both on time and money. And so just recognizing that that's something that each of us deal with. I like this quote from Steve Jobs. Um, that's another thing you can assume about me. I'm a Mac user. No, um, no hard feelings towards PC users, but um, as a musician and an artist, 
and an engineer, that's, that's been the route for me. So um, you can read this quote here, but technology is great when it works, but it's really the people that are behind the technology and what we do with that technology that really makes a big difference. So as I said uh, previously, we're all in different situations here. And I think that's really important to, to keep in mind. We're, some of us are in person. Some of us are live streaming. Um, some of us are pre-recording and then streaming or recording, pre-recording and then offering on demand, or some of us are doing a mix of some or all of these. So it's really hard in, a, in 30 minutes to speak to all of these. And so I'm not gonna attempt to do that necessarily. I'm gonna do a terrible job of that, I'm sure. So um, I, I wanna leave plenty of time at the end for, for your questions. And so um, I was telling Valerie that, um, a lot, I've learned a lot since we originally talked about me doing this and things have changed on my end as well. So I, I think it's really important to ask ourselves this question, what, what's our goal? So when we're looking at technology in church, we need to ask ourselves, where are we going? What are, what are we doing this for? And that's gonna be a question that's answered differently by everyone. Just to give you an idea, when the pandemic hit at Country Club, Christian Church, I sat down with our worship director and we drafted what a worship, what worship would look like going forward. We had made the decision that we would, that we would stream, that we would actually pre-record and then stream. And we wanted to know what, what was most important. And what we decided, our goal was that we wanted to create not an online church but a worship experience and so for that for that to happen we we translated that to mean a couple things or a few things so one of the things that was important is that we put the words on the screen for for the hymns and for the scriptures and and for the call to worship um, the other thing is is that we wanted to be able to blend our nine o'clock and our eleven o'clock service styles which is organ and the use of a, a jazz trio, soprano sax, bass, and, and piano. We wanted to keep certain elements of the service that we thought could still have a, a degree of particip uh, participation, which was the offertory, uh, time of prayer, moment of silence. And then, and I know not all churches could, can make this decision, but at our particular church, we were able to make the decision to have communion be a part of that worship experience. And that was really important. I know that not all churches, um, I mean, th there's debate over that and not all churches have extended that as part of their uh, worship experience, but that was important for us. Um, prior to the pandemic, we, we had three services, 9, 10, 11. We streamed only the 11 o'clock. We used OBS software. If you don't know what that, that is, that's okay. We, we, can, we can talk more about it if, it if it comes up or if you have a question about it, but it's free kind of uh, broad open source broadcasting software. We also used a paid service called StreamSpot um, and that would show our video uh, on our website. And then we would offer that video on demand. We in our sanctuary have a Steinway B piano um, we have a Schantz organ, four manual, um, 67 rank. We had two PTZ optics cameras. Those are kind of mounted in the very back of the sanctuary that are joystick controlled by the sound tech. Uh, we have an Allen and Heath QU24 soundboard. We had some really, we have really good quality mics for our speaking in our sanctuary. We had okay mics um, for our music. Nothing great though. Today, um, some of the enhancements or the things that we've changed um, during the pandemic, we are all online. We do not have any in-person worship. And based on the decisioning here at our church, we will not have in-person church for the foreseeable future until there, there's major changes in, in the world. So 
Um, and I know a lot, of, a lot of you are maybe not in that situation. Um, so that, that comes with a lot of mixed emotions. Uh, there's, there's reasons I really love um, what we're doing now. And there's reasons that I really, that it's very challenging. We pre-record pre our services during the week. And then I post edit all of our recordings, both audio and video in Logic uh, on my Mac. And then also uh, the video side of things in Final Cut Pro. We still stream at nine, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock because that's, our, that's when our congregation is used to, to being able to access their worship online, but these are simulated live broadcast. And then we, um, we still use StreamSpot to put, put the stream out on our website and then to go to Facebook Live. And then that video is available on demand. Some of the upgrades that we made in equipment in, in recent months. So right now, all the organ recordings that I do, I actually do at home on my Hauptwerk organ. So I don't actually use the church's organ. And that's a, that's a hard line decision on my part because I wanna optimize the sound of the organ um, to get the best full spectrum, high quality sound. And I can do that easiest by using Hauptwerk organ. Again, because we're all pre-recorded, I have the luxury of doing that. And so that's, that's the decision that I've made. We use two Sony cameras now instead of our uh, cameras at the, the back of the sanctuary. We had one, this, this PXW X70, and I just recently added this HXR MC88. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about cameras later. So uh, we bought a new stream, streaming recording device, uh, the Aja Hilo. Um, and so and I'll talk a little bit about encoders and we added some new microphones. So we were able to get some, uh, a nice pair of AKG microphones for our instrumentalists and vocalists, uh, a new set, a uh, stereo set of DPA microphones for a piano, which is really, I mean, it's night and day difference on our piano recordings. And just recently purchased a pair of Avinson STOs uh, for uh, omnidirectional microphones for capturing organ and our space. Okay. So um, let's see here. Okay, it looks like Valerie's put the link um, for my handout. And if you go to, to that handout right now, this, uh, this, little this little pyramid that you're seeing is actually from the first link in the handout. So at the very top of the handout, um, under cameras and more, there's a link for JWS. And if you click on that, that, that goes to Joel Smith, Joel, joelwsmith.com. And I, I really liked this, this pyramid. Um, he, he talks about on his website, he has tons and tons and tons of incredible blog posting of recommendations for video equipment and, and such. But he, he uses this model and that is that when it comes to doing video and audio and these kinds of things, you start with skills and experience. You start with high quality content. And then from there, you, you start looking at what are we gonna do with audio? What are we gonna do with lighting? And then the lens and the camera and then everything else. So in other words, you don't go out and buy a $5,000 camera when you don't know what to do with it, right? You, you start small, you start with what you have and then you build on that. And you start by equipping yourself with skills and experience. And, and from there, you can, you can build a, a good quality tech ministry at church. So I think this is a good model to keep in mind as we're exploring some of these things. I apologize if I'm getting too technical. And I know that a lot of us are organists and this, this might go right over your head, but some of, uh, especially with the audio, I wanted to address recording organ, especially and, and microphone use for organ. And I think even when we have, um, organs are really difficult instrument to re record and to capture. And I think even sometimes when we have, um, some good audio techs on board. They're, they're not always familiar with organ just because it's 
such a niche um, market in, in the audio industry. The first thing though with church being online is you can't compensate for poor audio. So you can have the most glorious looking video ever. And if you have terrible audio or you have audio that's not that great, it, it will degrade your, your, your video. So that's just something to keep in mind that audio is, is in my judgment is more important than video. It's got to sound good. So um, I, I put here piano mics, these DPA mics, they have little holders that are magnetized and they magnetize right to the, the inside of the soundboard of the piano. They're really tiny microphones, but they really capture a nice spectrum of sound. If you're trying to get good piano sound, this is what the professionals are using in, in piano miking these days. Um, and they're not cheap at $1,300 a pair, but they're kind of, I mean, you can certainly spend more money on that, but those, these are kind of a real sweet spot for piano mics. Going on to organ microphones, I would say that if you're gonna st if you're gonna start simple and kind of start from the beginning, you're gonna want to start with you know, something like a Zoom product. Um, and I think Alana she she mentioned that she she used a Zoom recorder for her audio uh, when she was recording her organ, and that's a Zoom recorder like the H4n um, or the I think she used the H6. Um, th these are great devices, and they're really not they're really not that expensive and they're gonna give you really good quality audio for the price. Um, the next pair of mi microphones that I recommend, and I recommend these because I have a friend, both, both me and my friend have used them with a large degree of success for organ, and these are the Avinson STO2s. They come in at $550 for a, a stereo pair, and they're made by a company in Austin, Texas, uh, called Avinson. They, they handcraft them there and they ship them out from Austin, Texas, which is also a plus in my opinion. Um, what you're getting with these is an omnidirectional microphone. It's a, it's a small condenser and they just, they're really um, natural sounding. And so if you place these out in your sanctuary, in your church, you're gonna get a really, really clear, warm sound. They do have a, a higher noise level being at, at their price point. So you do potentially run into to noise, but for the price and for what you get, these are not a microphone that you're going to hear recommended very often because they're not one of your big companies like AKG or Sure or you know the, the, there's uh, or Audio Technica. You're going to see names like that thrown around all the time. But I would highly, highly, highly recommend if if you if this is in your price point, looking at these Avinson STO2s for organ. I, I know they're, they're tried and trusted. If you want YouTube videos of, of an organist using this particular uh, microphones so you can hear the kind of response that he was getting, um, I, I don't think that's a link that I shared in the doc, but maybe I'll add that because um, great, great successful mi microphone for organ and not gonna, and they're somewhat affordable. If you want the best microphones out there for organ, you're gonna be spending $4,000 for a pair and you won't, you won't be sorry, but <laughs> you've got to have the budget for it. So um, the CMC6 uh, with, with MK5 capsules, these sh shops, um, they're, they're going to give you similar to what the Avinsons are, but with a much lower noise floor. So you're not going to pick up any background noise. And really, that's, these are going to be the top of the line organ mics. And in the links on your handout, both... Um, one of the, I, I referenced two articles under the miking section. And I think if you, so if you go out there, you're going to be able to see under mics for this best recording microphones, part six, piano and organ. That's going to give you some good advice. And then there's another article under organ that says best microphones for miking pipe organ. And they mention um, the, the shops and, and they mention some other microphones as well. But again, not, not in everyone's budget. So. Okay, um, I'm not gonna say much about lighting, but obviously lighting makes a big deal when you're trying to make good video. 
but it can also be really challenging and expensive, especially when you can't add more light to your sanctuary, which most of us are kind of in that situation. And some of us deal with poor lighting. Um, I know that that's a challenge in, in my own space here. So um, with video, I'm gonna say, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna top out at 1080p video. You're not gonna wanna shoot in 4K. So whether you're pre-recording or going live, you're just not gonna be using 4K video. People at home, most people at home are not gonna be watching in 4K. Streamers and encoders are not gonna support it. Even streaming platforms, um, they're, they're, re they're relatively, we're, we're not there yet. And, and for the money and for the cost to store 4K and to process it and to edit it and so on and so forth, not worth it, okay? So, but that being said, that doesn't mean that you can't shoot with a, with a camera that's 4K. So you can shoot with a camera that's 4K and have incredible optics. And you can even shoot in 4K sometimes if you wanna downsample and ultimately basically do a cropped image where you get more data and then you can crop down and out, output to 1080. But for most of us, we're, we're gonna just stick to 1080p. When it comes to cameras, it's all about the sensor. The larger the, the sensor, the better the image quality. So when you're paying money for a video camera or a DSLR camera or a mirrorless camera, you're paying, most of your money is going to the quality and the, the size of the sensor. Some questions to ask ourselves when we're looking at video is, how is my lighting? How far am I gonna be from the source? So how, how far is my camera gonna be from the thing that I'm trying to shoot? Do I need to simultaneously record the, record the video and output to a screen or output to a switcher? The other question is, do I have camera operators? Do I have switchers? So these are things that we've got to ask ourselves when we're looking at video. In terms of lighting, my recommendation is if you can afford it, always buy a camera that has at least a one inch sensor. You may not know what that means, but when you start looking for cameras, they're pretty good about saying, you know, one inch sensor or full frame. You're gonna see a lot of one divided by 2.84, one divided by 2.3. That's, that's not a one inch sensor. Uh, it, it'll, it'll say full one inch sensor if you're looking for a camera. You need to determine how far you are. So you, you're gonna, that may depend on the camera that you buy and you're gonna look at the optical zoom to tell you how much can I zoom in from 80 yards back in my sanctuary to the front of the sanctuary, that kind of thing. Or maybe you don't need that kind of zoom because you're gonna be really, you're gonna put the camera three feet away from your target. Also, you need to know, do I need to output SDI or HDMI? And again, if, if you're saying, hey, I don't know what any of these things mean, these are good things that you, you, you have a discussion with your tech person or you can talk to someone like myself more about it. Um, but these are kind of things that you gotta look at when we're looking at cameras. Um, so people say, well, what's the best camera to use? Well, the best camera is the one you have. And again, I'm gonna use um, Ilana for an example because she shows in her video, right? She used a really nice uh, Canon uh, DSLR. She also used a phone and she used a cheaper can, right? So she, she, she shot with what she had. That's a perfect example. You start there. Um, another option is you can use these PTZ cameras, which are pan, tilt, zoom cameras. They're joystick controlled. And these are a great option for churches when you don't have a camera operators or you know you, you're not gonna have two or three people to operate cameras. You have one person to do that. Then a lot of churches end up using PTZ cameras. They aren't gonna give you the best image quality for camera. You can buy PTZ cameras that look really good, but you're gonna spend a lot of money on them. Um, again, something with a one inch sensor or larger. I prefer video cameras if you're going that route versus DSLR or mirrorless, but Alana used a DSLR camera and it looked amazing and it will look amazing. So if you're shooting with a, a photo camera and you're shooting video on that camera, and you can pre-record your video, then absolutely. If you have access to a DSLR mirrorless, I'm all for it, because you're gonna get a great image. You're gonna get great optics with, with lenses and, and zoom and, and uh, depth and depth of field and things like that. So 
but if you're doing live, you're going to want to stick to just a regular video camera. Most likely some people do some crazy things with uh, DSLR mirrorless cameras and they just place them all over. And I'm, I'm curious if with um, Jeremy's um, what kind of cameras, cause he, I, he, I think he mentioned seven different cameras um, that he was using. It'd be interesting to know what kind of cameras are, are located throughout the sanctuary. Um, and generally it's best to try to stick with the same brand if you can. So if you're going to shoot three cameras, try to shoot three Canons or three Sony's or three Panasonic's mainly because of color. So Sony looks a lot different than Canon and Panasonic and J JVC and so on and so forth. So that, that's a general rule. You can get around that if you're, if you're post editing, but um, yeah, try to stick to the same camera brands for all your cameras if you can. Um, here, here's some more specific information, but if you're looking for a video camera under the $2,000 range, Sony's and Panasonic's, you're going to find a lot of good cameras in that range. Um, the Sony camera that I picked up the, the other day was $1,200 and it had a one inch sensor. It looks really, really nice. Has, I think like 10 X optical zoom. Um, and the only reason I bought a Sony, I, I would have, probably bought a Canon instead, but I already had a Sony and sticking with the same brand at this point, it just made sense to buy a, a similar camera to again, what I already had. So Canon tends, if, if you're starting from scratch and you're saying, Hey, we're going to go buy some new cam cameras. I would highly recommend looking at Canon. They seem to be the best with skin tone, with color. They're just they're kind of one of the most trusted brands when it comes to, to optics. If, if you're going to go that route, um, a lot of, a lot of companies that are recommending cam video cameras to churches are recommending this Canon XF 400 and XF 405. It is a $2,500 camera in the XF 400 and a, like a $3,000 camera for the XF 405. The only difference really is how it's output. The one outputs with an HDMI cable, the other outputs with an SDI cable, but they're, they're essentially the same camera. You can see the specs here. They're both 4k cameras and this is what companies are recommending for churches. A lot of, a lot of churches that have the, the budget for are using this particular camera. By the way, you don't need to take copious, I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, don't worry about uh, frantically writing all this down because my slides are in that handout. So under slide presentation, all my slides are there. So you'll, you'll have access to those. Um, if you are doing video cameras in a live situation, you will need a video switcher and I prefer to use a hardware switcher over software and you're going to want to use my, my trusted brand is black magic. Um, I've used them with, with lots of success. Um, this other Lumen tech, I'm not familiar with it, but I'm seeing it um, rec highly recommended by a lot of reputable sources right now. So you're going to spend about at least a grand on a good video mixer. And the thing that you're going to want to look at, where you're going to have to spend more money is if you want seven cameras, a thousand dollar switcher is not going to allow you to plug seven cameras to a larger switcher kind of thing. So your price will be dep dependent on how many cameras you want to plug into that switcher. And what that switcher does is it allows you to then quickly switch on the fly in the, in during church between your different views, your different cameras. Um, encoders. So what is a video encoder? A video encoder takes your video, typically live, and it, it takes, it would take that video from the switcher. So let's say you have two video cameras set up in our sanctuary. Those cameras are going to a video switcher. And then the video switcher is gonna be plugged into a video encoder. And that encoder is gonna encode that video signal so it can be sent out to Facebook or to Google or to YouTube or to some other uh, video streaming service, okay? And there's kind of two encoders that I would recommend. Our church just purchased the second one, this Aja Hilo. Um, and we actually haven't used it yet because we've been doing pre-recorded, but we're actually gonna use it tomorrow night for an online class. And we're gonna send live signal straight to, to YouTube Live um, using that. And it's, it's, it's a, I didn't put on here, but the Aja Hilo is about $1,300 as well. The Resi Ray encoder, 
uh, we, Valerie took a survey and someone mentioned that their church um, is now using the, one of the Resi encoders. And I would, if you're looking at, if you're having constant issues with buffering or people are complaining that, hey, I'm logging on, I, I'm trying to watch church and it keeps freezing on me or that kind of stuff. And you're having lots of complaints about that then you're probably going to want to look at your encoder and say, okay, maybe, maybe it's time to upgrade. I would highly recommend looking at this Resi Ray encoder for $1,300. The only catch, I guess, with that is that you will be forced into using a subscription plan by, by Resi in order to use your encoder. But if you're already paying for a subscription plan for your video at your church and you're having reliability issues, then I would highly look at, at, at this route because there's huge churches using that platform with, with, with high, high degree of stability and success. Um, the, the most common platforms that are people are using nowadays are Facebook Live, YouTube Live. Um, our church uses a service called StreamSpot. We pay quite a bit of, month, quite a bit of money. We, I think we pay uh, $250 a month for that but that allows us to upload our videos after I edit them and I can pre-schedule all my services for nine, 10, 11 so that Sunday morning, I don't have to do anything. It's ready to go live. And it will actually send that out to YouTube live and Facebook live for me. So it has automated scheduling. And that's the main reason why you'd want to use a paid service like StreamSpot or Decast or something like that is for scheduling simulated live broadcasts or things like that. The other thing I want to point out to, to people is you might go take a look at this churchonlineplatform.com. My understanding is that some very well endowed church developed this platform and then open sourced it for the world, basically made it free to all churches. And I haven't used it, but it looks like it has a lot of potential. So what it does is it allows, it, it basically is a video player for our online church service. But a distinction that, that I really like about it is that it has built-in chat next to the video player, which is really good for engaging your congregation, getting people when they're watching the video to chat amongst themselves. To, to, um, you can have greeters welcoming people just like you would at, um, in, in, in a live service. You can also um, have links to your uh, give buttons uh, attendance buttons. You can also schedule or have someone moderate links. So for instance, let's say you're doing offering and you're asking for, you're doing, you're collecting offering. You could have a link for the offering appear right in the chat window at that very time in the service where you're doing the offering. So to me, it, it looks like a very promising platform for engaging your congregation online and making it more of a, a worship experience. Um, instead of just feeling like they're tuning in and watching a video. Um, I had some questions about this and I'm going to say in general, if, if at all possible, you can avoid zoom whenever you're trying to do live music. That's the, that's the best course. Now that may not always be possible, but um, music doesn't work great over zoom to be honest. And if you have to, you can enable an option to preserve original sound. I have a link for that under the Zoom section in my handout that will walk you through that. But yeah, just, just try to avoid Zoom if you have to do live music. Use, use something like YouTube Live is going to be your best bet for something like that. Or, or pre-record and put it on, on YouTube and, and it's going to sound great every time. Um, I did have some questions about uh, effective Zoom choir rehearsals or online choir rehearsals. And I don't have time to talk about that, but I put a, a great playlist um, link in my handout under the Zoom section. So go check that out. Um, someone who's put a lot of thought and attention into running Zoom choir rehearsals, way more than I could ever, um, more information that I could pass on to you. Um, went to all the work, creates, shows you how he structures everything. Again, it's just one person's way of doing it, but really insightful. I've reached out to him. He's in the UK. He's a music director in the UK. I've reached out to him. Guy Bunce, really nice. Very, very, very helpful. So check that out if you're interested in resources for Zoom choir rehearsals. Um, tips for audio. 
when when it comes to recording organ or doing anything with with audio you really have to play around with it you need to go set up your microphone and you need to record yourself playing the organ you need organs hard because it, it can be very soft and it can be very loud so it can be really hard to set those levels you need to practice that and you also need to look at the proximity of your microphones to your organ pipes the worst thing you can do is put your your microphones right next to your organ pipes it's going to sound terrible you want to put those mics out in the space preferably as far back from the organ pipes as you can so that the sound of the organ really has the opportunity to develop in the space and then your microphones capture that. Um, if you don't have a pipe organ and, and you're using a digital organ, this is a great opportunity for you to be able to plug your, the sound of your digital organ straight into an audio recorder. So don't use microphones in that case. You want to, you want a direct input or output from the digital organ into whatever you're using to record because that's going to give you direct from the source quality sound and that's always going to be best. You could do something like I'm doing. You could use Hauptwerk to capture the best sound, um, especially if you don't have a great pipe organ or, or you just feel like the mics are really not capturing the organ the way that you want. Um, so uh, be creative with, with how you're doing that. Um, you know, we, we don't, we don't, in our services, we don't show the organist a lot. Um, we, we, we make it very in, intentional when we do, partly because we want to show the words on the screen so that the congregation can feel the, the invitation, the opportunity to sing the hymns. So we show words to the hymns while the organist is playing. And um, on my handout, if you go to, um, I think I titled it, Country Club Christian Church Worship. You can go to our worship archives and I, I would encourage you to, to watch. Um, the, the best one you can watch is the Easter Sunday. If you go to the, I think it's April 12th, that'll give you, that's kind of the pushing the envelope. But um, any of the Sundays will give you a good snapshot of kind of what we're doing week, week in, week out, how we're doing our worship slides and screens, um, the text on screen the audio quality, all those kinds of things. It'll give you a good idea of what I'm doing here at Country Club and maybe shed some light as to why I suggest some of the things that I do. Um, if you are gonna show the organ and you have the ability to do that live, then you're gonna, you're gonna wanna try to make it as engaging as possible. Use multiple cameras. Um, you, can, you can set up GoPros. They're, they're small and, and you can get them out of the way so they're not kind of obtrusive. Um, you can buy some cheap Canon Vixias, you know, in the $200, $300 range that work really well. And you can route those to a video switcher so that you have, you know, you can show the hands from, from the left side or the hands from the right side. You can show your pedals. Um, everyone loves, if you can rig this, if you can rig an overhead shot with a, like a, a GoPro and look top down at the keys, people love that angle. It's, it, it's really engaging to people. Just need to be creative with your space, and um, but again, I, I don't I don't think it's necessary. Start with the audio. Make sure you have great sounding audio of your organ, and then if that's going well for you, then you can start branching into how we're going to do video and how we're going to make it look engaging. And if you decide you know what we we're not equipped to do that at this time, then look look at ways that you can put words of the hymn on the screen or a, a beautiful picture of your sanctuary or a shot of your sanctuary, or use different imagery in place of maybe showing the organ at that time, and that's okay. All right, moving along, we need to, need to hurry up here so we can save enough time for questions. Um, I've been talking about this a little bit, but you can use branded titling. You're gonna see this in, in uh, Country Club's worship videos. I don't like to put text directly on video, I usually like to use a little background because it pops more. And so text, text on just raw video can get a little bit hard to read. And so I like a, just a solid color um, contrast background for my text, whether it's you know, a, a, a rectangle at two thirds rec, or one, one thirds rectangle at the bottom um, with some white text on screen. You'll, you'll see examples in my services. 
Um, or you can use a full screen slide with, with words. You can use slides for announcements. You can use still imagery, uh, high quality photos. Um, a lot of times still imagery can be used real effectively if you're, if you're post ed, if you're editing, you're pre-recording. Um, but you can also use those slides in, in a live service if you have a switcher and you have the people to, to man that. Um, just quickly recognize that it's really important that your church have the right copyright licensing to be able to do broadcast and stream. So um, at Country Club, we have both a copyright and a streaming license to CCLI. And these kind of are done for different things. One license is, a, is more for printing bulletins. And if you're actually wanting to print musical excerpts in your bulletins, but so we have all of these licenses. Um, nowadays though, if you're, if you're doing music, you really need a streaming license and a copyright license from CCLI at a minimum. And if you have those, you will be covered uh, as you're streaming to YouTube, Facebook, and, and to your other paid streaming platform. So just keep that in mind. You wanna be comp compliant and legal. Ultimately, we're trying to engage our congregations. Um, you can do that. I mentioned that one church online platform. Look into chat. You know, are you are you engaging your congregation through chat? Do you have option for prayer requests? Do you have give buttons? Do you have coordinated links where you can invite them to give now when you know when when the pastors are ta talking about the offering? Um, are you collecting attendance? Do you know who's worshiping with you so that you can reach out and and fellowship those people? I think that's really important. Um, we're trying to communicate, we're trying to inspire, and we're trying to connect with our, with our congregations. And it's, it's certainly a challenge for us all. Um, and we all have different limitations and all, all, all different budgets and resources. And so, you know, um, my heart goes out to everyone because I know um, w what a challenge this can really be. So um, that concludes uh, the content that I have for my presentation now. And so I'm excited to to get some questions and um, I guarantee there's questions I can't answer, but I'll certainly try. And um, so let's, uh, Valerie, I think we're ready to, to go to Q&A now. If that works for you. That would be great. Um, so I think at this point, um, we don't have that many people. If somebody has a question, feel free to Unmute and uh, ask it, or you can put it in the chat. We'll take a look at it. I have a question. This is Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Um, could you put your link for the handout on the screen once again, or can Valerie do that? I'll do it. I, yep. Okay. Put it up again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a question, Matthew. Uh, this yeah. is Ilona. I. First of all, I just, uh, this is fabulous. This is just so much information that actually my church is uh, uh, doing some of the stuff that you're talking about, but there's a lot of information I can actually share with them because I think they'll be extremely valuable. We have been having issues with the Vimeo uh, yeah. and it having uh, problems with buffering and problems with people ha uh, viewing things. And I was wondering one of, if purchasing one of these encoders actually would help with that. Um, do you know of if, if YouTube is better than Vimeo or does it really, or, or does it really depend on the encoder? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So most of the time when you're having, so the answer is yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> so um, yeah, but you bring up a really good point. So there can be bottlenecks in a couple areas. The first thing that you want to check would always be the internet connection at the church. So let's just assume that you're doing live. Um, if you have, you can have great internet and you can have a firewall that's blocking your internet such that you have very low upload speeds. Um, the only reason I know that is because I've learned from, you know, real world experience. So first thing you want to see is what is our upload speed at our, with our internet at church? Um, mm -hmm. Do we have enough bandwidth to upload video? Um, so next, then you want to look at your encoder. Uh, some churches are using uh, the free open source OBS. We were having some issues and I eliminated that. And I went with buying a $1,300 encoder in hopes 
that that would improve some of our buffering issues. Um, mm -hmm. If if you're still having issues after the encoder, you, you've you've signed off and said, look, we we verified we have great internet, and now we have a great encoder. Um, mm -hmm. You shouldn't have issues with your major streaming services like Vimeo or Facebook or YouTube, so long as those first two things are really working right. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if YouTube YouTube is going to be your best platform in the world, right? I mean, it's going to be hard to beat YouTube. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a solid internet connection or you have a poor encoder, it's up to you to get that stream to YouTube. They can, do, they can handle it just fine so long as you can get it to them. So I think that's where you want to look at um, a resi encoder. Now, mm -hmm. you're going to – I don't know what the subscription plans are. And it, I'm just curious, by, is there anyone on the call that's using the resi encoder at their church right now? The, you know, we just started uh, last week. Okay, and we were using Stream Monkey before then. Okay, is that the same thing? Are they? Am I using the right words? Stream Monkey then to Resi. Okay, so yeah, so you 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 probably don't have a ton of feedback at this point, but I'm guessing that um, I mean obviously someone on your staff um, knows what they're doing enough to even have heard about Resi. Um, the only way, re reason I came across it is that there's a very large church down the street from us that used a service called Living as, um, I think Living as One, I think that's right. Resi bought that company um, and, and they just changed their name. Resi is short for R-E-S-I. It's in my handout. It starts for resilient, basically re resilient streaming. And they, they, they claim to have the most resilient streaming protocol offerable to, to churches. So um, I, I would say that, you know, I don't know what you have to pay monthly to, to operate that encoder, but depending on the amount of people that you're trying to reach every Sunday, it might be definitely worth the church's investment to look at that. Great question. But did, Alana, did I answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And the, and then you mentioned another thing uh, about 4K versus 1080. And, and that, was, that was also fascinating because, of course, everybody wants to record in 4K and output in 4K. And I wonder if that also affects the, the speed of upload and then, then download. Of course, there's like transcoding. I, that's yep. the, the, yep. something I understand that also connected with that. And can you elaborate a little bit on that 1080 yeah. versus 4K? Yeah, you're, you're not going to want to shoot in 4K. In, unless you know how to do it in a way that the bottom line is you're always going to output to 1080. So yeah, if you're trying to push 4k or whatever, a lot of these services are even going to restrict some of that. They're not even going to allow you to do that because the, 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 the market can't really bear it at this point. There's not a lot, there's not enough demand for it. And it's so in, intense in terms of the, the media and, and, and the infrastructure to really make it a viable solution that for church, I, I would stay away from it. Now, if, if you're pre-recording, I don't have a problem with you shooting in 4K, but recognize that it always takes more memory. It always takes more processor to edit. I mean, 4K will bring your computer to, to a crawl if you don't have mm -hmm. the right hardware, right? Yeah. So, I mean- We've been there actually. <laughs> yeah. So in the end, in the end, I, I did it. I did it a couple of weeks and I thought, why am I doing this? I'll never do this again. This is not worth it. <laughs> and even, here's the thing. I watch our church services, which are 1080p, 60 frames on my 4K mm -hmm. TV at, at home all the time. And it looks beautiful. So wow. you, you're not really, especially for a church service, it, it's not worth the hassle and the headache and the costs that are associated mm -hmm. with it, in, in my opinion. So, Got it. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment real quick. Thank you, Matthew, for all that information. I'm a native born Kansas City, and I have two cousins that are members of the church where you're serving now. So it's a, okay. a very interesting situation. Yeah. I'm watching from Redondo Beach, California. Okay. I was a member of the Central Arizona chapter for the many years that I lived in Phoenix. So most of you people don't know me, but I was the organist of Ascension in Scottsdale for 10 years before I migrated to Los Angeles. This has been lots of fun. I thought I would see a few other people, but uh, 
a wealth of information here. Thank you ever so much. I'm glad I watched. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Any other questions? What What are the challenges that you're, yeah. Let's see. Well, our challenge now, uh, we began in person just this weekend, we've incorporated so many new cameras. In fact, the, the Nimrod video that we showed, that's actually really old news. Even right. though we filmed it in June, we've added different cameras and updated. And I wanted to try and answer your question. We have a variety of camera brands right now. We're, we're trying to become more uh, stable, but it's just mix and match. Uh, but yeah, now our, our issue is communication because yeah. we did add a guy in the balcony he also works on putting the service together, but for filming and different camera angles. So now we don't have a way to really communicate with him because we also have an organ mic up there. And if he speaks too loud, then he's going to be picked up into the mic. So we're, we have to get, we're going to order headsets with little mouthpieces. So that, that's our, our biggest upcoming concern. And so, so Jeremy, how many uh, cameras do you have on the organ dur during live? Uh, the majority are available to get to the organ. Uh, yeah, I think we, we have seven. If, it might be six. When I mentioned Nimrod, that was because we had a drone, some drone footage okay. that we just overlaid. You can't have a drone in service. It's too loud. Yeah. But we have one pedal cam. Okay. And uh, most of, we have four in the balcony and three on the sides, or you saw one on my face. Mm -hmm. uh, so I... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I have to smile all the time. So uh, yeah, they can get a myriad of shots. Uh, I is never there, know what they want. And is there someone musical that kind of can gauge when to switch to <laughs> which camera? Yeah, I will alert them if there's a pedal solo or often during my post loop, for example, if they, if I've been going along really fast and all of a sudden it's slowing down, they get the hint that Jeremy's probably winding up. So they'll start to zoom out. They like to do that pretty typically. Uh, but to be honest, no, they, they just have general ideas about music. Uh, yeah. So I have to throw them as many hints as possible. So it, it involves a lot of coordination if I want them to be really on their game. So I just tell them about my music and what to listen for. Yeah, that's, I think, I think that's really awesome. I think you're, honestly, you're way ahead of the curve than most of us when it comes to that. Um, and it's awesome that you have had that opportunity. Um, I think it's really, I think this is the challenge that we're all facing is that how do we go from, you know, we've been pre-recorded or, and now we're, now we're having to go live, right. Or we're having to do both or we're having to do it all. Right. And it's, it's, it's not easy to do pre it's, it's, it's easy to look great pre-recorded. It's a lot harder to do the same thing at that same quality level live. That's a real challenge because like you're saying, the communication, having the staff, I mean, even if you have the equipment, now you've got the issue of how do you coordinate that and how do you run it effectively? And that comes down to communication. And this is why really, really large churches have a whole booth and they have a whole team where someone is, all they're doing is just scripting and calling out shots, right? They're just, they're just saying camera one, camera three, camera seven, camera five, camera four, Q. Okay, camera four, go live, you know, and, and someone, I mean, basically it's a broadcast. Um, and, and, that become, and that's pretty much unreachable for, for most of us at this point. I mean, even having dedicated camera operators is like a no-go, right, for, for a lot of us. So that's a real challenge. Yeah. I think as soon as one person has an idea that keeps you up at night and you just feel like somebody needs to know, I mean, even if it's, as, if it's as simple as adding an extra camera for your feet yeah. but just not, and you think it might be possible, I think we have to communicate that and just get the ball rolling. Otherwise, uh, other people might not have that on their radar. So, yeah, we're, we're past that now, but now is the, the point for us to just overly communicate. Yeah. And so we're all in this together, especially in the middle of, okay, we're not in summer anymore. But middle of summer, we have plenty of time to tell each other and to meet and plan out the service. But even, even now, September, whatever it is, it's still pretty slow. So I think even if we don't have all the technology, still we can communicate to better plan 
whatever one or two cameras we have. Yeah, and I, I think it's also our, our opportunity. You know, one of the things that I, I've heard as feedback is that for children and exposing children to the organ, you know, I, I think that having camera shots on the organ is really important if you can do it because it engages parts of the congregation, especially kids that, um, you know, they, they don't always get the, the back behind the scenes opportunity to see what's going on. And I think that that can be really engaging and really important um, for organ in general, for just evangelizing, you know, organ and the use of organ in church. And I think, um, you know, that's, that alone for me is one reason to kind of push towards that uh, goal. Yeah, this is this is a great uh, uh, conversation for me because we are in two weeks we're going live and doing both live streaming. So the stuff that Jeremy is talking about is going to be happening to me, and this is not going to be pre-recorded anymore. It's just going to be a live service that's also live streamed, and this is it's causing a lot of stress to everybody, of course, because yeah. um, it's a lot of it's a lot of information, and it's a lot of coordination, and the worship planning is going to be a totally different hmm. beast right now than it used to be. So um, I might actually reach out to both of you <laughs> separately yeah. because I have lots of other questions, but I don't want to take too much time. So yeah, I'd be happy to talk. Thank to you so much. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? I saw another hand. Yeah. Well, we don't have a lot of cameras. We probably have one basic camera and um, an audio recorder. And, and we do have some very good mics, but I find that, the pedals on the organ usually do not come out very well. And so most of the time, if I remember and plan ahead, I try to put out something that's an organ stop that has a lot more cut to it. Um, I'm a little concerned about when we go and do both live services and then recording as well, because I think for a while we'll be doing some of both. Do you have any great words of wisdom for me? Yeah, spend five hundred fifty dollars on those Avinson STO twos. Um, I mean, it's amazing to me the difference in in the amount of pedal because you bring up a good point. So the the organ that I have here, the Shans, the pedal division is it's really weak. It's 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 just it's gutless. I mean, there's just we we actually don't have a true thirty two foot in the pedal division. It's all resultant, and so it, it's really yeah, it really lacks. <laughs> Uh, the bottom end and but adding those what was interesting is adding the Avinson microphones the other day just playing around with those in the sanctuary with the idea of going live I'm not going to drop four thousand dollars on organ mics I'm just it's, it's not going to happen but I was able to drop five hundred fifty dollars and the, the difference in sound based on what we had before in the sanctuary was really night and day and one of the things particularly that I did notice was I felt like there was a lot more presence of the pedal division. But again, I mounted the, I put those mics in the very back of the sanctuary. Okay. So bass is non-directional. It, um, but you also have to have the space for those waves, those larger waves to develop. And so if you put those mics in the back, now you get the compound of those waves developing in the space. And you may, you may find that you get a little bit more out of your pedal coming through your mics just by where, I mean, inc increasing the quality of the mics, but also your placement. So if you've got your organ mics really close to the front, you might try moving them to the back and see, does that make a difference in terms of, of the pedal sound? Great question. Yep. What else can you, I you mentioned that you mentioned that um, uh, when recording a or uh, including a digital organ that you thought it would be best to plug directly into it. And I don't know, I, I haven't worked with many digital organs, but I have a friend who has who's at a different church and they have a digital organ and he said his sound was terrible when he plugged directly into it. And I advised him, I said, well, I think you ought to go back to your speakers and put mics in front of your speakers. I think it's related to what you were just talking about in, ter in terms of capturing the room. Yeah. So I'm curious what you, if you, but this is the only digital organ that I've ever really kind of talked about or even explored. So 
maybe you have more uh, knowledge about other organs, but I wonder if other organs have a better output. Maybe they add reverb or something to it. And maybe yeah. you could talk a little bit more about that. I don't know how many people have digital organs, but that might come up for them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think you're, you, I think you answered your, I think you answered your own question, but I, but it's a great point. So you would want to put the mics right next to the speakers. That's going to give you poor sound. But I think you pointed out the reason why you may be getting a poor sound directly out is because those speakers get to project in the space and they're going to do a lot better in terms of the sound in the space, but direct out is maybe doesn't have the reverb or doesn't have the development of the sound in the space. And that's why it sounds really poor. So that's a, that is a consideration in that case. I would say you're probably going to want to mic the room, mic the room, don't mic close to the speakers and not go directly out unless you have a way to run it through an FX processor and you can run reverb. Like you pointed out, if you can run reverb live off of that direct out, then you stand a chance. So, um, you know, some people would use like a lexicon. Um, uh, I think it's a, like an MX 400, uh, a, a reverberation unit, which you can't buy those anymore. You used to buy them for like a couple hundred bucks. And now they want to, now they only sell the two, $3,000 models. But even if, if your sound guy or someone knows how to run, run that sound through a reverb unit prior to going out, then you might have some success with that. But it sounds like maybe in, in your situation, you're going to just want to put your, your mics out in the room to get your best sound. So. I think that's a, that's a good point. Re reverb, reverb and the space, you know, the, you notice I say, I talk about the space a lot, but the best stop on any organ is always the acoustic, right? Or the worst stop on the, any, I mean, it can, it can make or break, you know, it, it can make a, a mediocre instrument sound glorious in, in a glorious space but it can, you can take an incredible pipe organ and put it in a poor space and it'll, it'll make it sound terrible. So, I mean, that's, that's what we constantly fight as organists. Unfortunately, that's the way it goes. And organs aren't cheap and spaces aren't cheap either. So we kind of, we kind of get stuck with what we have. So great. All great questions. Um, we had another question in the yeah. chat. It says, what is the best way to filter out ambient room noise in post-production audio editing for music? Filter out ambient and post. So my question is, why is there, so is this, uh, is this post-production of a live service? I'm guessing why is there noise to begin with in a post-production? Because if, the, if there's noise that you're having to edit out, then the miking didn't go right if you're if you're pre-recording potentially right so if you're pre-recording you want to make sure that you're muting channels or things that don't need to be capturing sound so you're not picking up extraneous noise you want to use the mics that are going to give you the clearest cleanest sound of the source without getting extra stuff the only reason why you would have noise i would think is if you're in a live situation and but again, in a live situation, this comes down to me, the audio engineer, or you don't have an audio engineer and someone's not muting channels. So you're picking up extraneous noise from microphones, say from the pastor or from the pulpit or from here or there, when you should have just had your organ mics on or your room mics on, right? And so, and that is a problem, that, that can be a problem. I'm not sure if I'm answering, air conditioning can be loud. Um, yeah, yeah, turn off your air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's terrible. I mean, and this, and this would be the reason, so this would be the reason why you would buy a $4,000 microphone. Okay. So at some point, if you're fighting it that much, and I understand because I have a similar situation here, I, it's, it's either, I mean, even the blower noise and some organs can be really offensive depending on where those microphones are in relationship to the organ. Again, if you get them back out in your space, now you're not fighting like we had hanging mics that were about eight feet from the pipes, but they were picking up a lot of blower noise and a lot of HVAC noise. So again, moving those microphones to the back of the room away from those offending noises is going to help cut down the noise potentially. However, you'd now have a greater distance from your source. 
right? You have a greater distance from your pipes. So you could still get a lot of bleed from the noise depending on the quality of the microphone. And that's where spending $4,000 on a microphone will eliminate that because the noise decibel level, the sound floor of those microphones is going to be dramatically less and only going to allow in the source of the organ. And that's why you spend more money on microphones and, and preamps and that kind of stuff. So it's not an easy, uh, it's a big problem. I understand I deal with it here and it's, it's not an easily solvable problem, but hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of things to start looking at. see great anything in any other questions so I just encourage you to to look um, you know some of the a lot of the links may not be applicable today but there may be you know two months from now or whatever you may come back to this handout and if I think of other links as I go because this is kind of an evolving thing right we're all learning we're all learning from each other. If I find other links and stuff, I'm gonna start, I'm, I'm gonna keep put adding them to this document because I'm sure other people can benefit from it. Maybe one day if I ever get some time, which I don't see happening anytime soon, I would make a website. But I think some of these things are things that you might wanna come go back and visit. I love that that J, that first link, JWS. You know, if, if, you're, if your church is in a situation where you're looking to upgrade cameras or encoders or, video equipment, definitely have your tech people take a look at that. That guy um, who, who wrote all those articles has a lot of industry experience and has really spent an enormous painstaking effort, time to identify what's the best equipment out there. And he has some great links of, you know, best streaming kit for under a thousand bucks or this or that. You know, if you, if you have a lot of money to spend um, under, under streaming platforms uh, or uh, stream kits rather, I put Resi stream kits. Resi actually sells encoders, video cameras, like a whole package of like, if your church were to really do this right and just go all in, you, you would spend, you know, $20,000 and they're gonna give you all the equipment that you need to, you know, to do video right. Audio is kind of another side of things, but, um, so there's some kits out there. If you don't have a tech person to kind of go cherry pick each and every part or put these kinds of things together. Um, but like I said, I'll, I'll try to add some other links. Um, or if, you, if any of you find links out there, you say, hey, I found this resource. I think it'd be incredibly helpful. And you want me to add it to this sheet, we, we, can, we can do that as well so other people can access that. I'd lo love to see it kind of evolve and just we help each other out with resources. Well, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing this with us today. That is, it's fantastic information and just putting together that document was, was huge, beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, Matt. We appreciate that. And thank you everyone for coming out today. Um,